this video we're going to talk about periodic trends. So that is properties of atoms that we can predict based on quantum mechanics and the position of an element in the periodic table. And a closely related topic to that that helps explain a lot of the periodic trends is something called electron shielding. So there are three uh, atomic properties that we're going to talk about in this chapter. We're going to talk about atomic radius uh, in this video, ionization energy, and electron affinity in two subsequent videos. So before we get into the specific periodic trends, we want to talk about electron shielding. So electrons are all negative, and so we know that they repel each other. When an electron gets between another electron in the nucleus, that electron that got in between um, partially negates the attraction between the second electron and the nucleus. And this is what we mean by electron shielding, right? So to kind of demonstrate that, imagine that we had a helium nucleus, right? So helium is atomic number two, so the nucleus has a plus two charge. And then it has two electrons in the electron cloud outside of the nucleus. And so the electrons are whizzing around uh, in the electron cloud outside the nucleus. Well, if we have one electron, imagine it being there. Of course, uh, it's flying around, but for, for the time being, we'll, we'll imagine that it's sort of static. If another electron gets in between the red electron in the nucleus, essentially it's blocking some of the attraction between the red electron and the nucleus um, because this electron is repelling the electron. Uh, and this is what we mean by electron shielding. So when some electrons are closer to the nucleus than others, they effectively shield the charge of that nucleus and, uh, and decrease, in this example, at least temporarily, the attraction uh, between the shielded electron and the nucleus. Now, core electrons are on average closer to the nucleus than valence electrons. And so they spend most of their time closer to the nucleus than a valence electron. And that means that core electrons are more effective at shielding nuclear charge for the valence electrons. And we can quantify that effect um, with a property called effective nuclear charge. Uh, and you know, way back in one of the early chapters when we were talking about atomic structure, we used Z to represent the atomic number. So the charge on the nucleus is the number of protons, it is Z. So then Z effective is the effective nuclear charge, right? So for a valence electron, what charge of the nucleus does it see taking into account that the core electrons are going to be shielding it? And so the effective nuclear charge is calculated by taking the actual nuclear charge, the atomic number, and subtracting the number of core electrons. So if we assume that the core electrons completely block um, their charge worth of the positive charge of the nucleus, that gives us the effective nuclear charge. And so the smaller the effective nuclear charge, the less pull the nucleus has on the valence electrons. And so the, if we have a small effective nuclear charge, then the valence electrons are going to be less tightly held to that atom. And so here are a couple diagrams to, to try to help uh, demonstrate what we're talking about with shielding and effective nuclear charge. So I have three elements here, lithium, carbon, and neon. And these are all in the second row of the periodic table. And so lithium is atomic number three, so its nucleus has a plus three charge. Uh, carbon is atomic number six, so it, its nucleus has a plus six charge, and neon is atomic number 10, so its nucleus has a plus 10 charge. And my blue circle here uh, is to represent the core electrons, right? And in all of these atoms, uh, the 1s electrons are core, and so they all have two core electrons, right? So the total charge of the core electrons in, in all three of these atoms is negative two. And so if we imagine the valence electrons are then in the orange circles, right? on average, they're going to be further away from the nucleus than the core electrons. And so the two core electrons in each case are shielding the nucleus from the valence electrons. And so in lithium, the effective nuclear charge would be the 
charge of the nucleus plus three minus the valence electrons. There are two valence electrons. So the Z effective in the case of lithium is plus one. So that electron in lithium uh, only feels a plus one charge from the nucleus. In carbon, we have the same number of core electrons. We still only have two core electrons, but now the nucleus has uh, a much higher charge. And so the two core electrons block a smaller percentage of the, the charge of the nucleus. And so the Z effective for carbon is plus four. And for neon, the Z effective is plus eight. So all three of these elements are in the second row of the periodic table. And so you can see as we go from left to right across the periodic table, the effective nuclear charge increases. And that means that effectively the valence electrons in neon see a more positive nucleus than the valence electrons in lithium. And I've drawn the size of the valence electron clouds in the three atoms uh, on purpose, right? As the electrons experience uh, a larger effective nuclear charge, they're more attracted to the nucleus, and so they get sucked in tighter. And they're more tightly held than the electrons in lithium. All right, so effective nuclear charge is very closely related to the uh, atomic properties that we're going to talk about. And the one we're going to talk about in this video is atomic radius, right? So literally that is just how big is the atom. And, you know, the way we define the size of an atom is um, it's one half, the radius of an atom is one half of the distance between the nuclei and a molecule consisting of identical atoms. I'm not going to ask you to know this definition, right? Uh, atomic radius is the size of an atom, but, you know, we need some official way to define that because, you know, the electron clouds are kind of fuzzy. So there are two things uh, that we consider when we're looking at these periodic trends, atomic radius and the others. We're looking at how does the trend change as we move up and down a column in the periodic table. And then how does that trend change as we move from left to right across the periodic table? So for atomic radius, the trend as we go down the periodic table is pretty intuitive, uh, right? As we go down, there are more electrons, and so the electron cloud is bigger, and the atoms get bigger, right? More formally, we can think about the fact that um, each time we go down uh, a row in the periodic table, the valence electrons are in... Uh, a shell of one higher principal quantum number, right? And so the larger the principal quantum number, the larger the orbital, and the uh, farther away on average the electrons are from the nucleus. So as we go down the periodic table, uh, the atoms get bigger. Okay, so as we go up and down the periodic table, I think the trend uh, is pretty intuitive. As we look at the trend going left to right across the periodic table, if we didn't know anything about effective nuclear charge that we just talked about, it might seem a little unusual uh, because as we go from left to right uh, across a row of the periodic table, the atoms get smaller, right? So even though they have more electrons, the atoms are getting smaller, but this is due to the effective nuclear charge that we just talked about. If I'm considering atoms in the same row of the periodic table, they have the same number of core electrons, but as we go from left to right, the charge of the nucleus increases while the number of core electrons stays the same. So the effective nuclear charge increases as I go from left to right, and so the valence electrons effectively feel a greater pull from the nucleus, and that sucks the electrons in tighter, and so the atoms get smaller. Right, and so the general trend as we go up and to the right in the periodic table atoms tend to get smaller. And the reason this is important, uh, the size of the atoms, uh, is because it's, it's related to a lot of the other properties that we're going to talk about. The smaller the atom is, the more tightly held the electrons are, the harder it is to remove them. And the more it want, 
might want more electrons. And that's something that we're going to explore uh, in detail when we talk about ionization energy and electron affinity. So as we go up and to the right in the periodic table, the atoms tend to get smaller. And up and down is pretty intuitive, uh, but the reason they get smaller as we move to the right is due to electron shielding and effective nuclear charge. So we also want to think about the size of ions. And I think this is pretty intuitive. So cations are smaller than their parent neutral atom, right? So cations, remember, are positive ions. And so when an atom loses electrons, um, there's, uh, it still has the same number of protons. And so the nucleus, the positive charge, is trying to corral fewer electrons. And so it's able to suck them in uh, more tightly. And the greater the charge of the ion, the smaller it gets. So the less electrons there are competing for the attraction and position close to the nucleus, the closer they're able to, to get to the nucleus. And so this is a, a picture just kind of showing that. In the silver, this is the size in each case of the neutral atom. And then the purple or maroon radius is the size of the ion in each case, right? And we know that lithium, when it forms an ion, it's an alkali metal, uh, likes to be plus one as well as sodium and potassium. And we can see for beryllium and magnesium and calcium that are plus two ions, right? They get sucked down even smaller compared to the size of the original atom. As we go to plus three, they're even smaller still. So cations, positive ions, are smaller than their parent uh, neutral molecules. And the greater the positive charge, the smaller they tend to get. And so the opposite is true of anions. As we add more electrons, right, anions are negative ions. As we add more electrons, the, the ions become larger. And again, the greater the charge of the ion, the larger it tends to get. Uh, because we have more electrons, but the same number of protons, and so uh, you know, the nucleus in some sense is, is less able to corral and attract those electrons to it. And so we can see a similar picture here, where again, the silver is the size of the neutral atom, and the, the green is the size of the negative ions. And in this case, the, the difference between the charges is less pronounced than for the, the cations, right? The oxygen negative two is a little bit bigger than fluorine minus, but you know, that's not a huge uh, difference in this case. But it, it is certainly true that in every case, the negative ion is larger than the neutral atom. All right, and the final thing uh, that I wanted to mention is uh, we are sometimes asked questions about uh, the size of atoms in an isoelectronic series. Now, so I wanted to mention what that is. So an isoelectronic series would be atoms and ions that have the same electron configuration. So an example of an isoelectronic series would be nitrogen three minus, oxygen two minus, fluorine minus, neutral neon, sodium plus, magnesium plus two, and aluminum plus three. If we were to determine the electron configuration for all of these uh, atoms and ions, we would see that they all have the same electron configuration as neon. And so uh, all of them have the electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And so all of these um, atoms and ions have the same number of electrons. But as I go from nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine to neon to sodium to magnesium to aluminum, the number of protons is increasing. And so when we have an, an isoelectronic series, generally the, the larger the atomic number, the greater the charge of the nucleus, the smaller the ion is. All right, and then we have two more videos on periodic trends, and the next one we'll talk about ionization energies, and then we'll talk about electron affinities.